Hello, I am Lucy Keller from Historic Beverly. First, I'm going to give you a basic introduction on our Spotlight presentations. During the talk, I will be switching between sharing some slides and viewing the object. I will try to let you know when I'm about to switch because there may be a slight delay during those transitions. I will also try to let you know if I'm going to point out any detail on the object. You will see my gloved hand when I do that. Today, I'm going to tell you about the Poly Rantoul sampler we have in our collection. We have a number of other samplers as well. I will be sharing some of them with you on the slides later. So right now I'm going to go to the sampler. So this sampler was stitched by Polly Rantoul in 1792 when she was nine years old. I am now going to point out some of the details. So you will see my gloved hand in the picture. It is cross stitched on a linen base using several colors of silk thread. There is a border on all four sides that is done in the satin stitch. Now I'm going to switch back to the slides to look at the, some of the sampler's details in close-up pictures and give you a little more background about Holly and samplers in general. So Polly's sampler design consisted of the alphabet and the numbers one through zero, along with several different border patterns to show her decorative stitching ability, as well as the more mundane letters and numbers. Notice that in the close-up detail on the right, there is no letter J in the sequence, only H, I, K, and L. During this time frame, the letters I and J and the number one all looked very similar. They were all written very similar. So here are a couple more close-ups of the details for you. You see how none of the alphabet sequences contain the letter J. I've got H-I-K-L here. And then in the lower case, we've got again H I K M L. You'll notice, however, that the letter one, the number one in this section for the numbers, appears to resemble the letter J. So now I'm going to give you a little background about Polly Rantoul, the needleworker herself. Polly Rantoul was a nickname for Mary Rantoul who was born in 1783 in Salem. She is Beverly's squire, Robert Rantoul's younger sister. This is a portrait of Squire Rantoul, which we have in our collection. Polly married Andrew Peabody Jr. in 1808. They had two children, Andrew Peabody III in 1811 and Mary Rantoul Peabody, whose nickname was Molly, in 1813. Historic Beverly happens to have Mary or Molly Rantoul Peabody sampler in our collection as well. So I'm going to show you now our mother-daughter samplers. Here on the left, you see Polly Rantoul's sampler. Her da daughter Molly Rantoul's sampler is on the right. Both women were named Mary, so they used their nicknames Polly and Molly most often. You'll notice right away that Polly's sampler is a bit more decorative and uses several colors of thread. Molly's sampler is much simpler and doesn't even include the typical upper and lower case alphabet and numbers. Instead, she chose to use a single color of thread and simply lists her parents' birth dates and their marriage date, followed by her and her brother's birth dates. So now I'm going to give you a brief background on why samplers were so widely worked on by young girls. Samplers derive their English name from a French word, assembler, meaning any kind of work to be copied or imitated. Samplers are referenced as early as the early 1500s. 
the earliest known surviving sampler is a spot sampler that was estimated to be circa 200 BCE to 300 CE and was from the Nazca culture in Peru. It was in the Museum of Primitive Art, New York City. The earliest known surviving European sampler from 1585 is in the Netherlands Openlucht Museum in Arnhem, Netherlands. In their earliest form, samplers were put together as personal reference works for needleworkers. They were trials of patterns and stitches which had been copied from others, records of particular effects that had been achieved which could be recreated again. They would have been the work not of children but of more experienced needleworkers and some from their quality of professionals. Since there were few pre-printed patterns or instructional books on stitches available for needleworkers, a stitched model was needed. Whenever a needleworker saw a new and interesting example of a stitching pattern, they would quickly sew a small sample of it onto a piece of cloth, their sampler. The patterns were often sewn randomly onto the fabric as a reference for future use and the needleworker would collect extra stitches and patterns throughout their lifetime. These were often called spot samplers. This next slide is an example of an 18th century sampler. These 18th century samplers often became more elaborate and were framed as families proudly displayed their daughter's work to show relatives, guests, and potential suitors how accomplished and educated their daughters were. These samplers were stitched more to demonstrate knowledge than to preserve skill or instruct on unusual new stitches. This particular sampler was done by a young lady named Nancy Locke. It was done on linen ground with silk threads. It was created when Locke was 14. The register and verse are framed with a row of cross stitch and there are two different letter styles, an inscription and a flower border. This sampler shows a schoolgirl's first effort at needlework. Some were quite simple as this one done by Tabitha Balch in 1793 when she was 13 years old. The stitching of samplers was believed to be a sign of virtue, achievement, and industry. And girl, girls were taught the art form from a young age, preparing themselves for the day when they would initial linens for their own houses. The young girls practiced by making a marking sampler where they worked their alphabet and numerals into the fabric. Historic Beverly has Tabitha Balch's sampler in a kit that you can buy to work yourself. This next sampler is another very simple basic schoolgirl sampler wrought by Anna Thissel. The sampler is done on a linen ground with multiple colors of silk threads in cross stitch. A register of uppercase letters and numbers is stitched on three rows across the top and a register of lowercase letters is on the bottom two rows. Between the two letter registers is, is, a, is an inscription. Anna Thistle, her sampler, worked in the 13th year of her age, December the 1st, 1794. There is minimum space between the words of the inscription, making it a bit difficult to read. The needlework skills these young girls were learning were important attributes in the future management of their households and the personal adornment of their families and themselves. Alphabets gave practice for the marking of linen and the spot motifs and border patterns could be put to use in the decoration of clothes and domestic furnishings. This sampler by Joanna Lovett was stitched in 1816 when Joanna was 13 years old. 
It consists of a verse at the top and the alphabet and numbers below. This sampler was created on a linen ground with silk threads of various colors. Flowers and other vegetation are stitched around the verse and the alphabet. An elaborate plant and flower border seems to be more the focus than the letters and the numbers. Clearly, this was a very accomplished young needleworker. Most schoolgirl samplers included the name of the person who worked the piece and often the date or age of the needleworker at the time the sampler was completed. Some samplers included inscriptions, often Bible verses or poetry or popular sayings at the time. Some even included partial genealogies of the needleworker, as we saw in Molly Rantoul's sampler. This lengthy sampler was wrought by Elizabeth Hill and contains all these typical elements. It was stitched when she was 11 years old in 1813. It is stitched on a linen ground with silk threads of varying colors. The sampler has an upper case as well as a lowercase register and a row of numbers all done in cross stitch. It also has an inscription and at the bottom of the sampler is a partial genealogy of the Hill family. Although some girls were taught by family members or skilled servants, that was not always the case. Often girls between seven and 14 years old went to needlework schools to learn this skill, which not only enabled them to decorate clothing and household objects, but also provided an acceptable means of earning income as teachers of embroidery or as seamstresses should it later become necessary. This sampler shows that Beverly had at least one such school, Miss Wittridge's school. This sampler was created by Lindia Lovett Ray. It was stitched at, the, at age 11 in 1840. It is cross stitched on a linen ground with silk threads and contains the family lineology here at the bottom. An upper and lower case register and bands of a variety of st stitches between the rows is framed with a border of decorative stitches all around. At the bottom is the name of the school where this sampler was made, Miss Wittridge's School, Beverly, Massachusetts. The Miss Wittridge of the school in Beverly is almost certain to have been Hannah Wittridge. At the time, there is only one Wittridge family in town. During the 18th and early 19th centuries, it was common for a young lady to teach the art of embroidery in her home to a group of girls from eight to 14 years of age. This remarkable example of a sampler is quite different from the usual run of the mill sampler. Most samplers were on white or off-white material that was inexpensive and readily available. This sampler was wrought by Elizabeth Creasy in 1811. It was stitched when she was 12 years old. It is quite vivid with its background of a dark green Lindsay Woolsey fabric. It was worked with both plain and twisted silk threads in a variety of colors. Note the forest imagery at the bottom that is worked almost as a reverse image or a negative image with the white off-white thread against the back dark green background. There are three uppercase registers as well as one row of numbers. The inscription reads, as this sampler shall continue still, the guide and model of my house skill. May Christ the great exemplar of mankind direct my ways and regulate my mind. <clears throat> Samplers fell out of use after the middle of the 19th century when embroidery became more of a pastime or hobby rather than a household necessity. 
There are over 30 samplers in the historic Beverly collection, including two for which we sell kits for reproduction. The needleworkers in our samplers collection range in age from eight to 14, although most were, were between 11 and 13 years old at the time they created their samplers. We sell two different sample, sampler kits in our Cabot shop if you're interested in trying your hand at one of these samplers. One is the Tabitha Balch one, which we showed earlier, and then the other is a Hannah Foster Thistle. If you have any questions, please contact research at historicbeverly.net. Please check out our website at www.historicbeverly.net for our upcoming programs, walking tours, and exhibits. You can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram as Historic Beverly. We have an extensive collection of samplers that have been inventoried and cataloged in our online database that can be found here at this website. We also referenced an exhibit catalog of ours from 2007 called Wrought by Your Hand, New England Samplers, 1749-1884. Thank you for watching this Spotlight Talk. We look forward to seeing you at another program soon. Bye.